Do you like movies and games also? Listen so much more, they all know. Lotus and friends, welcome to Corrective Consciousness. Welcome to Corrective Consciousness, episode 104, the podcast where we explore the inanity of pop culture. I am your host, Lotus Prince, and this is... The Old Man Stompy. And Nicky Mitz. Welcome back for a delightful Thursday podcast. And I will once again remind everyone that not only is this the last week of this, but this is the last episode of Corcon or Recon that is going to appear, uh, appear on my Lotus Prince YouTube channel. As usual, I will provide you with a link for the identical podcast on the Corrective Consciousness YouTube channel, but after this point, starting next Tuesday with the Recon, it is only going to be on the Corrective Consciousness channel. So I recommend that you subscribe to that if you want to keep uh, getting notifications of them, because they're not going to show up on my channel anymore, and unless I give them a shout-out, then you're just not going to hear much about them outside of little, like, trailers and things like that just to be aware that said though we have an interesting show for today because we've got a couple of cool topics to discuss and one of them can be both cool and hot whoa because we're going to be looking into food so <laughs> what what have you seriously like that amazing segue this is this is why i'm the host so that's like way better than any of the segues from recon this week <laughs> we tried really hard oh boy we, we had Flaming Wheels, which was amazing, but the closest I can come to flaming anything is flambe food. Man, smooth as butter. <laughs> Too good. For, for, for somebody so, who like, doesn't eat anything, doesn't know anything about food, like you sure do know a lot about food. Yeah. <laughs> well, we certainly sure we, we sure know a lot about food today. <laughs> so, yeah, what, what have you to say about food, cooking, eating, what have you? I've been making dinner for a while, I would like to say. Mm-hmm. But I cannot make chicken for life. We had really good chicken today. It was bad chicken. Okay, okay. <laughs> all right, all right. We had really okay. good chicken today. It was bad chicken. Okay, I, I guess Old Man Stabby is obligated to, to say that his wife's cooking is pretty... I did think it was good. <laughs> or good in some way. Or Damn, Old Man Stabby could really stick to his story. <laughs> To say that, like, the food was good. But on a personal level, for me, I, I've i been cooking for a while for my family and, and well, this family too. Which is me. Us, which is all my Stompy. And, <laughs> and <laughs> the the I, Stompy family. And I'm not really sure if it's, like, the Chinese way of cooking or, or something. I'm pretty sure it's not. But uh, all of these things are all personal, like, uh, I guess I looked up recipes here and there, but they're all, you know, you gotta cook it for yourself to to find out what you do and etc. But every time I cook chicken, it's dry as balls. I, mm. I can't, can't for life of me know how to cook chicken to its proper tenderness. It's always overcooked. And I am not really sure if it's like, you know, like I said, it's the Chinese way or something like that, but you know, you overcook things just to be sure that you haven't uh, undercooked it and get yourself sick in some way or form. Yeah, yeah. So, like, to tie this back into pop culture a little bit, you know, I think it's understated how important it is for some people to, like, know how to cook for themselves if you have the time and the energy to expend on it. You know, like, I come from tech culture where there's literally an industry based on producing foods like Soylent, which is just like a shake that's supposed to contain, like, all your nutrients for the day, and in principle, you could subsist just on eating that. I know the name is a little off-putting if you know what it comes from. Yeah, so, yeah. But, like, I'm sure that's on purpose. Um, but it implies that, like, people are really busy. They shouldn't spend their time cooking if they can avoid it. Spend all their time being productive, coming up with great ideas, you know, sleeping, working out, you know, not wasting oh, that hour a day, so to speak. Yeah, just having your shake. <laughs> Yeah, go out and have a beer with your buddies. Um, get so, business partners and sorrow and things. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, there's a social aspect to eating, too. Yeah. Not that any of us are social people. <laughs> we wouldn't know anything. Yeah, about I was going to say, social social like, aspect? What's you, what's social? Well, I barely <laughs> can first, first, you're talking you about guys. exercising with your legs. Now you're talking about social? What is all this? Whoa, whoa, whoa. 
This is the worst week for me to host. Video games. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was gonna say this is the worst week for me to host. Like everything is something I don't know anything about. Someone actually asked me. I can't remember if it was you, Mitz, or or our friends, but um, someone asked me if there was like a hiking video game. Hiking. Probably, I wouldn't be surprised. I know I don't know anything about like the simulator genre. But, you know, there's, like, Truck Simulator, which is just about oh, driving yeah. through, like, the countryside. I just saw that they yeah. released an Oregon expansion, because people really like driving in Oregon. And it is just nothing oh. but driving in Oregon. And, like, Washington. Um, huh. And, like, Farming Simulator and Soccer Simulator. They're like all, like, games designed to give you the closest thing to a realistic experience that you can get without actually doing that thing. Yeah. So, like, maybe there's a hiking simulator out there somewhere on Steam. I wouldn't even yeah. know where to go about finding it. That's the thing. I wouldn't be surprised if there were some sort of hiking video game, but off the top of my head, I can't think of one. Like, there's Breath of the Wild, a little bit, and, like, parts of Grand Theft Auto, where you can hike yeah. parts of the country. Yeah. So I guess that kind of counts. That's about as sure. close as you can get. It's not like, but there's not, like, an actual, like, hiking fighter to the World Warriors. Oh, my God. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because I-, I was thinking, based on your discussion in the recon... You know, you had mentioned Celeste about mountain climbing, but like, but then you actually play the game and you're double jumping and dodging enemies, and it's like, oh. Mm-hmm. So, from the cooking side, there is like I remember talking about Final Fantasy 15, where Ignis cooks for you, and I remember thinking that like the recipes were based off of real food and they looked delicious and they made me really hungry. There's a lot of like fiction where like looking at food triggers whatever like visual you know, stimuli that causes you to, like, get hungry even when you're not. What was the, yeah. what was the name of that? Flame Flame toast? Roasted Flame Roasted Toast. Flame Roasted Toast. Doesn't that sound appealing? So I made that just because it said, like, Flame Roasted. I was like, oh, is that bacon or whatever? I didn't even read the whole title. I just clicked the button and I was like, oh, I want that. It was just fucking toast. But it looked, like, <laughs> delicious. Nice. <laughs> well, you... didn't they didn't they put like a ridiculous amount of effort into like the 3d modeling the food for that game they definitely did it made me really hungry <laughs> food porn is a thing like oh yeah have you have you seen like the old like like the ghibli studio miyazaki films and anything like the food i like, like, I, I, like spirited away with the food yeah yes yeah, but it's not just that we went to the um studio ghibli museum when we were in japan and they have a whole room dedicated to the depiction of food in Studio Oh, Ghibli no. <laughs> like, the, the, the glow, the glare, the, the, the texture, the slimeness, the, the emulation of how cooking oil in, in the cast iron pan would, like, fluff, like, 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 uh, it was, like, bubble and... and sure, like, sizzle. And mm-hmm. sizzle, and the movement of the slip inside of the eggs from the grease pan to the plate and everything. Yeah, I mean, um, Ratatouille did this too in CGI. Yes. Obviously, like, the Studio Ghibli stuff was all how to animate food mm. in Ratatouille with CGI. Yeah. Um, but, like, the the notes that you're trying to hit when you're trying to, like, make food look appealing to somebody on the screen, they are largely similar. And, like, sure. for example, in Spirited Away, they really convey, like, you know, a lot of the time in film, no matter what happens to the characters, they almost always stay, like, stylish and beautiful, but people do not usually look good when they're, like, pigging out. Yeah. And they capture that in Spirited Away. Like, her parents are literally acting like pigs. They become oh, yeah, pigs they, later, yeah, they engorge themselves. But yeah. they're, like, really, really enjoying themselves, and it kind of makes it look like the food's really appealing, because they're getting so into it. Yeah. Getting so into the food. <clears throat> so, um, since we got married, Mitz has been, like, using this opportunity to like have her own kitchen and to like learn to cook a lot of stuff and to like teach me how to cook because I never really had to do it do it had to do it by myself and like when I was in college I cooked a few things I cooked pasta I would like stir fry some veggies and I didn't really care that much if it tasted kind of bad I didn't have the palate like well established to know that like oh I burned my chicken like sometimes you grow you grow to like it because it's all you have yeah it's like it's it's good enough and she looks at me in the kitchen and she's like do you want me to call your mother (laughs) <laughs> and tell her how you grew up as an adult, because I will. <laughs> Jesus. Sometimes if I do something particularly stupid in the kitchen or, like, thoughtless, yes, it's because I don't know it. Sometimes it's a violation of common sense. She see me, like, you know those, like, meat thermometers? Like, yeah. Like, it comes in a little plastic tube so you don't stab yourself with it. 
And, like, when I tried to take some chicken temperature, I just jammed the plastic tube in there. <laughs> nice. So, like, the temperature was totally wrong because the metal wasn't Yeah, it's like, it's cool. I should know that because I'm a physicist. But I still stuck the whole thing in there. Thankfully, it didn't melt into the chicken, as far as I can tell. But, like, she looked at it and she took a picture of it. She didn't tell me anything. She took a picture of it, sent it to my mom. She's like, your son did this. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> so, we made chicken today. Um... I have chicken a lot because I've been trying to get on a lower blood pressure diet. You know, I don't really have any major health, heart illnesses, but I know I have it in the family. Um, yeah, I was going to say you would tend to keep it that way. <laughs> yeah, I want to get used to a simpler diet without, like, the salt and the sugar that's, like, really heavy and prevalent in, yeah. like, today's cooking and, like, what you get when you eat outside. So, like, we live in New York City, and it's not too hard to find a restaurant that, like, services that because there's a lot of, like, older businessmen who need to be able to yeah. eat. So you can usually find, like, a vegan meal, a gluten-free meal, a low-sodium meal. Like, it limits your options a little bit, or you can just, like, ask people to use less salt and to, or to use more pepper, like my, yeah. my dad does at a steakhouse. That's what we did today. We put a lot of pepper on the meal. Um, and there's, like, spices you can use that that take the place of salt. And, um, like, Trader yeah. Joe's has a lot of, like, high-potassium, low-sodium stuff. You know, you can do it. Well, you, you, that's the that's the point. You use mm. you flavor your food via spices, not mm. just the right. Yeah, salt. that's the thing. I, I am rather interested in spices, but like even growing up, unless stuff was cooked into the food or whatever, like naturally, my family was never like a like a salt shaker kind of family. Mm. Like we've had the salt shaker on the side. It's it's basically exclusively for guests. Like, I couldn't even tell you the last time I actually poured salt on something, unless it was, like, unless it was like soup that was really watery or something. Right. And that's rare enough. Like, I, like we generally just kind of eat stuff straight. Mm -hmm. So when I go to a restaurant, like, or, you know, other people's cooking or whatever, it, it can feel a bit different. Right. Like, there was actually one time where, like, I was making some just, like, again, like, really basic. I was making some just macaroni for myself. And, like, I was looking at the box, and it was like, you know, try it with however much salt. And I was like, you know, I've never actually done that. Let, let, let me see what happens if I make this pasta with salt. And it was so disappointing because it tasted like macaroni and salt. Like, I, it didn't, the salt didn't bring the flavor out of every anything. It just felt like I was tasting macaroni and I was also tasting salt. And I was like, what is the point of this? <laughs> yeah. So, like, you're supposed to add a little bit of salt to the broth, like the, the water. water, when you're boiling. Yeah, I, I, I did that. I didn't pour it on the macaroni or anything, but sure. I was just like, that that this is it. Like, um, also, I'm tasting salt now. Like, thanks. <laughs> I, I think maybe you're, you, either you're, you have, like, super sensitive taste buds or, or something of the sort. But um, when I make uh, pasta... I don't know about that. I, I mean, it's yeah. a purely assumption. But yeah, like, like I'm not one of those people who can like be taste testers because they're like hypersensitive or anything like that. But yeah, um, I mean, I, I I can tell certain differences in something. Like I think I I don't really remember this myself, but I think my parents told me that like they had used different breadcrumbs for some recipe, and I think I was I, like I noticed it when I was a kid. Like not that the breadcrumbs were different, but I was like this tastes different, and they're like really. Nice. <laughs> I mean, so who knows? I wouldn't expect you to be a taste tester. If they like serve you a vegetable, I'd expect you to be like, not string beans, one out of five. Yeah, I was gonna say that would involve me being willing to eat more than like <laughs> one and a half kinds of food. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, um, I think where I was trying to get at was that like, um, growing up, like my my mother and my dad both cooked. Actually, they they both you know because being busy people that they are, they you know we don't eat out ever more or less I'm trying to always save money on food and etc but my parents yeah, eating out is expensive as hell cook, uh, you know mm. in order to take burden off of each other and whatnot and um most of the time my mom would be the one who um takes over the kitchen so even if i bought mm -hmm. supplies for the kitchen and my mom deems it unuseful or something she'll probably like hide it somewhere in one of the many drawers that we might have in the house but mm -hmm. but you know um but so i didn't actually learn how to really really cook i i was aware of cooking i knew how to bake um cake mix boxes or whatever but i never really know how to cook cook like the, there's like lists and guides and uh, techniques and uh, it's, it's yeah endless, this, this endless is this is thing. this is one of those things that like 
I would imagine, like anything else, you get used to, but, like, I- I'm not used to cooking myself. And when I say cooking, I mean, like, the- I don't mean literally cooking. I mean, like, the whole range, like, pr- producing food in the kitchen. Like, I'm still mm-hmm. not used to that. So, like, I see a recipe. And, like, like recipes just intimidate me. Because, like, normally, I love step-by-step guides more than anything. Like, if you just threw me in a kitchen and said, go... I, I would have no freaking clue. But, like, with a recipe, it's like, okay, follow the steps. But what I what I never really take into account is that if you're making anything with a degree of complexity, it's like, well, you're going to need to heat this for 15 minutes. Uh, but the next thing you're going to need to do takes five minutes. So you need to, like, do, like, really be careful about your time management as well. You can't just wait for step one to finish and then do step two because right. your thing will have cooled by then and it'll interfere with the, the whole product. And it's just like, whoa, so much stuff to juggle. Right, and also... If you start to read more recipes, you'll notice that certain kinds of recipes are tuned to certain levels of, like, cooking proficiency. So if you yeah. don't know anything about cooking and the recipe is fairly simple, it will say, like, like add one pinch of salt for every cup of water. As yeah. opposed to, for an expert, it will say, like, add seasoning to taste under the assumption yeah, yeah, that yeah, you, you have you a know what to do. Of thumb yeah. for, like, how your oven works mm. and, like, the specific brands of ingredients you buy how much yeah. you need to add to get the flavor that you want they say that not, like, not to mention yeah go ahead at the top restaurants one of the basically what happens is they add like the maximum amount of flavoring that you can detect and no more okay that, that's fair enough well, well what i was also going to say was just like when it says seasoning too like what kind of seasoning like you might house rule that or there might be like you should know the appropriate type of seasoning for this kind of food and things of that sort right so like my um my co-workers at cern back when i worked over there like they would have communal dinners and that was really cool and some of them would make you know side dishes and they would tell me oh yeah this is this is like dill and allspice and and cilantro and i was like how would you have ever figured out that that was the ideal like flavoring you've probably been working on this yeah. for like a year it's an well, yeah, that's the practice. thing. Sometimes you really do just experiment and mm-hmm. see what seasoning works. Like, I, like I get, like I said, my, my family is generally pr- pretty plain. Like ketchup, mustard, and relish are like as far as we go. We don't really use a lot of seasonings. Now, I, I don't care about that at all as far as salt is concerned. But I, I do very much enjoy like well seasoned things like steak or something like that. It, it really does take you to a whole other place. Mm-hmm. It is, like, now that I've tried to get off of the sodium diet, it's become, like, really obvious how much of everything is just, like, flavored salt. Like, ketchup is just tomato-flavored salt. Barbecued sauce is just salt. Yeah, I mean, I... can't say that. Actually, some ketchup can be a little more complex than you think. It Mm -hmm. has vinegar in it. Mm -hmm. It gives you the... That is true. Yeah. Yeah. It has the salt to it. It it enhances the flavor. Salt is meant to enhance salt. Mm -hmm. speaking of which regarding all that salt though i i think i might have mentioned this on a previous podcast like a long time ago but like this is more of an like i think an american thing but there's like this isn't spread around all the time but in america i think like the uk or maybe it's england in particular has a reputation for having like rather bland food but i really don't think that's the case it's really more just we over flavor and salt our food so much that anything else tastes like weak in comparison like what when i went to scotland the food tasted perfectly fine to me like i didn't really notice much of a difference but then again like i'm not like again i'm, I'm not a salt shaker pepper shaker person mm-hmm. so it's just like okay it's it's food it's me it's like the way it was you know designed to be eaten you know salt is what you the consumer put on it after the chef makes the food i definitely acknowledge what you and mitz are trying to say but like when you stop eating salt and sugar like you're totally right you start to detect how much of it is present specifically in american products Um, yeah i I, I was told that even our bread is sweetened and i was like whoa what (laughs) we had a chocolate cake last night with mousse and they could taste like the salt in it and i never really oh wow sea salt is really commonly added so yeah sea salt flavored caramel sea salt flavored Things. Yeah, that that I have so. noticed, but then again, the box or the package usually says it's sea salt, and like mm-hmm. so maybe it's maybe it's me believing it to the point where I can like actively notice it. But like I can definitely taste the salts in products that say like it comes with sea salt. Mm-hmm. So we did also decide that we were going to talk about our favorite foods this week. Sure. Why don't Why don't you go ahead and start us off 
Lotus Prince. Right, I mean, I, mean I, a... I am, I am so, I'm, I'm so bland. Like even my style of food is rather bland. I mean, I, I will say like when it, when it comes to eating meat and things like that, like I, I wouldn't say under normal circumstances that steak or, or meats like that or chickens or things are my favorite kinds of food. But again, if they're, if they're seasoned, then like I, I eat that very rarely. So it's like a super treat when it does happen. But otherwise, I mean, like, I grew up in, like, a, like, a, like a Jewish household in New Jersey and New York. So, I, I like just like Italian style food. So I'm, I'm a really, I'm really big on like spaghetti and meatballs and marinara sauce. It's like the, it's like plain by most people's standards, even my own. But like, it's just a really good. Uh, I, I can't say comfort food. I don't eat it for comfort, but like, it is comfortable when I eat it. <laughs> it's nostalgic. Yeah. Except it's nostalgia for now. Because you're <laughs> yes, I get the nostalgia constantly. <laughs> well, I, I never grew up with favorite foods, though. That's the thing. Yeah. I, I ate whatever I had at the time. I like I guess, like, because of the kind of life I, le- I live, like, I guess when I was a child, I guess, like, around five, six years old, I guess my favorite food at that time was, like, McDonald's. <laughs> oh, no I, doubt. I, 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 I say it was because, like, back then, McDonald's was, like, taste of gods and stuff like that. Because that was, like, the <laughs> American thing to do or American thing to eat. But, like, nowadays, when I'm, like, at the age that I am, <clears throat> um, I am, like, oh, McDonald's. Uh, I, I, sometimes I feel like I get the craving for it. Or, or, or I think I feel that nostalgia where I get the craving for it. But I don't really what about fried chicken? What? Korean fried chicken? Korean fried chicken is not a thing. We never ate anything fried as a, as a, as a child. Well, you certainly like, seem to crave it a lot now. What was the word? Like, yi hei? Yi hei is a hot... It's direct translation is, like, hot air. But mm. it could be referred <laughs> to anything that's called, like, fried. Or that's considered, like, grown in tropical climates. It's really hard to do, really convert the translation to, um, to English, but... It's basically saying that, like, uh, the food, you eat this food, it'll cause some acidic reaction in your body or something. It makes your blood more acidic or some shit like that. Or something of the sort. And, and it makes you feel not good after eating yeah. it. Yeah, you know? well, th- you that's why... Well. You don't feel healthy after eating it. Well, it'll taste really great now, but it won't, you won't feel very good after it. Yeah, no, that, that, that is accurate. Like, uh, I've only eaten, like, Kentucky Fried Chicken, like, a couple times in my life because my mom just can't deal with it. And, you know, when I finally ate some of it, like, way later when I was in my 20s, it pretty much had that effect on me. I was like, this is delicious, but then I immediately just regretted it, like, a few minutes later. Mm-hmm. Um, and even as far as the fast food is concerned, for me, it's probably Burger King and Wendy's. And I, I go to those very rarely because, like, I live in an area where... I could get a bunch of different kinds of foods that are, like, a step above fast food without being outrageously expensive. Right. But McDonald's was never a thing. Like, my parents hated McDonald's. So, like, I probably went to a McDonald's when I was two or three or something, but, like, literally never since. Uh, if you held a gun to my head, I could not tell you what it tasted like. <laughs> well, I wouldn't. I wouldn't. Yeah, don't do that. Don't test me on that. But that's what'll happen. I'll be like, I don't know what it tastes like. Right. Spoilers. Spoilers. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Now you know it's gonna happen. Not me. If you really want to know what I think of McDonald's, uh, I don't. I was I, my I life was saved twenty five years probably by the fact that McDonald's was absurdly expensive when I lived in Switzerland. For certain, mm. I just never ate it after that, and I have no taste for it anymore. That happened to me with gum when I got my braces. I was actually good and didn't eat gum when I had braces on, and then when I finally got my braces off. I, I had some gum, and I was like, yeah, this is pretty good. Oh, the flavor's gone. And I just kind of fell off of gum and I never went back. So when I was really little, I used to swallow gum and toothpaste until my parents found out that I did that. Don't you know that it'll stay in your stomach for 10 years? <laughs> it, it, it tasted good, so I assumed that it was food. So why wouldn't yeah, you yeah, swallow yeah. it? Minty fresh. Minty bits. Oh, well, that's why minty you carry the yeah. minty. <laughs> yes. I like uh, mint chocolate chip. But- I like... Uh, and the chocolate experiment, chip is great. Spearmint candies, like spearmint leaves. Yeah. Absolutely. They're, they're, my, my, my sisters-in-law bought me a bag of spearmint leaves, and they were like, this is old people candy. None of us want it. You can have it. <laughs> the, the, the leaves are old people candy, but like the red and white striped 
uh, mints, like the peppermint and the mm-hmm. green and white striped spearmint. Uh, I guess those are also kind of old paper candy, but like th- those are quite good. I've had those when I was a kid. Yeah, good times. Those, they're candy that old people have and give to kids, and I like. Yeah, them. along with like Werther's. Uh, I like Werther's. We have a box they're damn of, good, we have a bag but they're old like right next to us right no, now. Those are original, right now. Probably yeah, no, they're they're delicious, but they're old people candy. Shut the fuck up. I, I like eating them myself, but they're Who old people you? candy. <laughs> <laughs> so Along i would say that my personal smokes. favorite food actually so i made this whole big deal about being on a low sodium diet and it has been like absolute fucking torture for the last six months since i basically started it because like some of my mm-hmm. favorite foods are bagels which are like horrible and like full of sodium but just the regular bagel has like 500 yeah. milligrams bagel of sodium is made out of dough you sometimes might fry the outside or or boil the outside but yeah the ingredients that you use Inside. I think boiled is where it's at. Mm-hmm. Anyway, it's full of salt, and I also used to get like the everything bagel, which had a lot of yeah, extra salt on it, like all the seeds and everything. And the cream cheese probably also has salt. And then you get like lox, which is a uh, salted salmon, which also has like a lot yeah. of salt on it. So yeah, I ve- I very rarely had lox. It's it's good, but yeah, that's quite salty. Same same goes with corned beef. Probably my favorite kind of meat, uh, especially in a sandwich. Like, the best sandwich ever for me is corned beef and rye bread, mm-hmm. but, like, pastrami is also really good, but, again, super salty. Yeah. So, the other thing I like is Italian subs, which is what I used to get when we went to that sub place near us all the time. You know what I'm talking about. <laughs> the, the one that we keep bringing rice to by coincidence. By coincidence, because it's, like, the only place to eat anyway. <laughs> no, it's just super funny, because, like, Vice lives an hour away from us, and, um, there's, the, yeah, this sub place near us is, like... It's it's right there. It's so close to us that we could go there anytime we want. So we don't go there constantly. But when Vice comes over, it's like, hey, you know, we haven't been in a while. That place is really close and it's easy to bring guests to. But like, that's the only place we ever take Vice. And he's like, what is this? <laughs> it's just so kind of funny. I had the same experience when I started dating Mincy Mitts for the first time. And that like, I never had a Chipotle because there wasn't one near us in, yeah. in the New Jersey area. So I'd go up to Manhattan and she'd be like, hey, where do you want to go today? And like, yeah, I want Chipotle. And she's like, oh, I had Chipotle fucking five times this month. I don't want Chipotle. And yeah. She's like, oh, I'm never going to get Chipotle. Yeah. And the funny thing is now there actually is a Chipotle near us. Well, yeah, now there is. But there wasn't. Yeah, yeah, there certainly was not. And also very high sodium. Although, I would make an exception for um, Chipotle because it's highly nutritious. Chipotle mm. is, you know, like, it's Americanite. I guess Americanized Mexican food in a sense, mm. but yeah, you know, it has your meats, it has your veggies. Mm-hmm. Uh, Everything is grilled. Everything's the grilled. everything's fresh. Mm. It's got beans, which has a lot of protein. It's got guac, which is actually really good for good cholesterol. Yeah, um, I'm not saying that it's the best way to get these things, or even that it's like super healthy. But if you're gonna pick a fast food place, like Chipotle is not bad. Yeah, you could do worse. Yeah, <laughs> and it's also really filling, which is important. Uh, because it keeps you from like snacking and eating other healthy, unhealthy food. But then again, food. one burrito, one bowl, is kind of a meal, a meal well, and a half itself. Yeah, it's supposed to be. But you actually feel full as opposed to like a lot of high calorie options that make you still feel hungry later. Yeah. So, yeah. That's the thing that's like stereotypical of like American Chinese food. It's like you feel like because I think it's also because of the salt. It's like you mm-hmm. feel that you could eat again like thirty minutes later. So Mrs. Parents home cooking, like I love having that. Uh, we well, that's well, that's Chinese yeah. Chinese food, like not American Chinese food. Yeah, we go there like <laughs> once a weekish on days that we happen to be staying in the city, or have yeah. stuff to do late at night in the city, and we eat dinner there. It's nice, always. It's mm-hmm. like distinct from the stuff that Mitz makes when she's at home, plus the stuff that I eat when I eat out. And, sure. You know, I can't really cook any any full meals besides like boiling pasta and make, making some chicken yet. I'd like to be better at it. Well, boiling pasta, uh, I mean, for me, when gro- what, pasta was supposed to be like a, 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 a treat, like once in a mm-hmm. while, like it was oh, yeah? still re- really rare. And like, we don't, I guess we grew up having, not having the stomach for pasta. Uh, okay. Uh, to, to, at least for, for my Asian family, my Chinese family. Like, if they don't have at least, like, a few bites of rice, they will never feel full. No matter how big of a meal they would have eaten, have, having rice is that essential to, like, probably, mm. like, start up the enzymes in your system or something. Yeah. To make sure, like, something is actively engaging and churning in there. 
It's, it's the same for people who has been like vegetarianing or mostly vegetarian for a while and they suddenly eat meat. You know, you know it might sit in their stomach for a little bit before it starts yeah. to again. That kind of, you know, the, the, that concept of it. It's your, yeah, it's yeah, your, yeah, the your body's not quite used to it. Like in your stomach. Like yeah, the bacteria, yeah. they grow to digest the food that you eat and they get used <laughs> to it. So, um, like, I don't eat that much rice, so when I eat a lot at her parents' place, I get full really fast from all the rice. Like, I'll say sure. this, and yeah, I'll be rice like, is oh, pretty I heavy. Yeah, I can't have more rice. And they'll be like, oh, you want noodles? I'll be like, what kind of noodles? They're like, rice noodles. <laughs> like, damn it! <laughs> <laughs> nice. Yeah, I, I love rice, but again, like, the, rice is one of those things where it's like, I, I, I could just make a whole meal out of just that, but that'd be a huge mistake. Mm-hmm. Also, like, sushi, which is, like, rice and fish oil, like, yeah. is the most filling thing there's a really good sushi place near where we live. Uh, none of our listeners can experience that unless they happen to come by, but it is a favorite of mine. Yeah. Very, very hidden. It's, it, like, when people say, like, oh, yeah, don't eat too much oil and stuff like that, but it's like, I feel like some people don't quite understand what the difference in the type of oil is. Like, mm-hmm. like you have the, you know, your liquid oil, and then you have your solid oils, and then you have the oils that are, like, used in cooking to uh, lubricate your, you know, your cooking pans so it doesn't like yeah. stick and, and burn up your food. Then you have oil that's already inside the, the meats and um, and etc. And those are also in many different classes and categories. And and the the, the thing is that like the, there's this one item that we usually order. I think it's like the, the tuna... Fatty tuna dumpling. Fatty tuna dumpling. Okay. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's just called it right there. <laughs> fatty tuna dumpling. I'm pretty sure they didn't use real fatty tuna because it was actually relatively uh, cheap in price in comparison. It's I think it's fun. just called the tuna dumpling, and we've, like, mentally filled in the fatty part because it's so <laughs> filling. Yes. Okay. So, uh, what it is is it has, it has, like, it has, you know, the, the, it has the tuna outside, right? It covers, it's a tuna dumpling, so it covers the outside of it. The inside has more tuna shredded you know and everything probably has a little bit of oil here and there uh to for flavoring because uh if, if um if people you know you got if you guys the viewers do cook and everything you know you have your your canola oil your vegetable oils your peanut oil maybe you can use that uh, some people use sunflower oil coconut oil and such um but uh in you know in asian cooking a lot of times you'll find yourself seeing sesame oil as well and um, for me, I use like a drop or two of sesame oil just to for flavor because uh, sesame oil is not really particularly supposedly healthy. <clears throat> also, it's like really flavorful and smelly, really, even for it, a little it bit. It has a very distinct scent to it. It's a very strong scent. Uh, so you put a little bit of that in, and there's that type of oil that's in there. And uh, I believe they use either tempura, panko, or some sort, uh, you know, fried fried starch bread. Type of thing. It's not really appealing when they describe it like that, but it's delicious as you eat it. So you mix that in also to get that like uh, texture and crunch inside the, the roll. And that's a lot. It That one bite, um, super delicious, but it's already like you're not quite aware of it because it's not drenched, dripping oil. You know, right, really right. But it's, it's definitely a very oily piece. Mm hmm. So yeah, food. Yeah. So do do you have? Uh, does anybody have any uh, final thoughts on food? Uh, no, <laughs> there's too many thoughts on food. We go on and on. Yeah, Mitz can't do one final thought. I hope not. There's no final. <laughs> may, I, may I please give two final thoughts? <laughs> All right. Well, in that. Three, then. Yeah. Well, uh, in that case, then we can get to some fan responses to our last week's question. So. This is, um, we, we have two questions that were addressed. One of them is um, game, like video game or movie or book worlds that you would or would not like to live in. So we have two responses in that regard. Uh, the Katajana says, as long as I would have like protagonist powers, you know, you're not some NPC in these worlds because those mm-hmm. guys can't do anything. As long as I had protagonist powers, I wouldn't mind living in any world. It'd be damn fun. But... Thinking about it from the good old me point of view, I would take something very chill, like uh, Slime Rancher, which we had mentioned in the podcast, or I would even think about Bioshock Worlds, not in Rapture or Columbia, but just 
the world, because I'm sure it's a very interesting place. Maybe even Warcraft or Starcraft universes. I know it's war all the time, but it looks like interesting places to actually live in and discover. Also, probably Deponia world. It's a shitty place, but people look happy. Deus Ex wow. worlds, too, just to see the chaos firsthand. And from not games, there's Avatar The Last Airbender. It's just beautiful, as are places I would not like to live in any horror game. Uh, I would not want to live in the Sims world, because some higher power makes you drown in the pool or catch on fire all the time. <laughs> Sucks. If there was a great story about how, like, some guy beat his girlfriend at, at Quake, and then he came over to her place, and he saw, like, open on her computer was, like, The Sims, and there was, like, a Sim with his name, and it was on fire in, like, a tiny room with no door. He was like, Jesus. Mm, I, think she's, I think she's mad at me. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty great. Uh, Solidus Scully says, I'd live in any sort of game world, preferably to travel between them. I'd be bored being confined to just one, so why not remain as a dimensional traveling vagabond? I could be slaying demons in the Doom universe before jumping over into the Tales of universe for some fantasy adventure, before lightly topping it off with some sexy anime waifu loving and some, like, just any visual novel. Needless to say, real life is boring. I want to live in a world that's abstract and dangerous. Who needs rising real-world political tensions, military-scale wars, and Earth countries when it's so much more interesting in Metal Gear or Assassin's Creed's universe? Why bother dealing with my inner demons through psychologists or medication when a trip to Silent Hill would fix me right up if I get the good ending? Besides, adventuring seems more fun in the video game world than it does in reality, namely because more supernatural stuff is possible comparatively to the drudgery of real-world physics. Uh, sorry, old man Stompy. Uh, not, not to mention any ailments can be cured by means of a health drink or smoking some herbs for instant regeneration. Or in Middle Gear's case, I think, like, well, it wasn't health, but, like, actually just smoking anyway. Mm -hmm. And then, um, I forgot if I mentioned this one last time, so I'm at risk of repeating myself here, but this is in response to the best bow in games, what made you feel the best. And Fakafan was like, I don't know. I thought using bows was clunky or not fun, so maybe Gears of War because explosives. So those were uh, responses. Now, for the question this time around, it's actually a Fakafan question. Which game do you think benefits from having sprites instead of 3D graphics? And which would have been better the other way around? For example, I, Fakafan, think that Mischief Makers' sprites add a nice level of fluidity and detail to the character's look and animations that wouldn't have been well replicated in 3D at the time. You, know, you, you could probably say the same thing about like Castlevania, because this is a little unfair, because this was 3D growing pains, this wasn't quality 3D yet. Like, the new Castlevania in 3D looks pretty good, but like, N64 Castlevania, it's like, I see what you're doing, but maybe you should have stayed 2D. <laughs> So, like, anything yeah. in the early generation of 3D, like, anything from the PlayStation up to about the top of N64, like, yeah. that was a rough period, and a lot of those games did not age well. So, yeah. I'm going to give a lot of them a pass, because, like, I've actually seen people, like, post screenshots from N64 games and say, like, this is the worst 3D I've ever seen. And then someone comes in and says, like, I played this game 20 years ago, and I thought that it was impossible for games to look better than this. Yeah. No, I, I remember distinctly, I was playing Ocarina of Time, and I walked up to the camera. So, like, the ca like I'm looking right at Link's face, mm -hmm. and I think I had moved the, the camera around so, to make it look appropriate. And I was showing my dad, and my dad was like, yeah, that's all well and good, but, like, how does the actual gameplay look? And I was like, this is it. And we were, we were like, both impressed. But right. now it's, like, so polygonal. It's, like, you know, better than Star Fox snes polygonal but it's like look at all those edges and sharp lines and stuff but like it looks so much smoother now but it mm. did look damn cool at the time so i showed you a long time ago maybe a few months ago the the pro rest the i keep fire pro wrestling the ps2 yeah. game where like ricky dozon descends from the heavens you know oh yeah 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 and he has this like plasticky looking grin in his face that's part of what makes it so goofy is that he has this like stock unmoving face while oh yeah like faces from the heavens to like yeah face, massive faces were just yeah they, yeah I'm, so, I'm sorry go ahead no no like, I'm, that I'm, looks, I'm, being, I'm being rude yeah yeah that looked awful right and it looks bad now. yeah and it looked worse yeah on the n64 for the wrestling games right but for japanese wrestling fans to see that at the time like there was a reason why oh he yeah from the heavens he was a fucking national hero in japan and korea like that was a big deal 
Well, no, yeah, that's what I was going to say about N64 games. Like, especially GoldenEye, where the faces are just painted on. Like, mm-hmm. just, this is what a dude's face looks like, no matter whether he's hurt or what. It's just, like, it's literally, you have your polygonal faces, and the, or polygonal heads, and the face is just, like, a picture on it. And you, you can tell. Mm-hmm. Like, when you shoot a guy, he just still maintains his, like... Like well, like Doctor Doke in the facility. Yeah. If he ever dies, he just maintains his perfectly neutral expression, <laughs> and it just looks kind of kind of weird. Or like sometimes they change in one frame, and it looks really goofy still. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Literally, one frame changes. Um. And even in, like in the original Deus Ex, like the graphics I thought were kind of cool because I'm very slow to play games, but like even at the time, the graphics were kind of janky, and it's especially apparent today. But meanwhile, if you go to, like, Human Revolution and Mankind Divide, it looks, like, insane. But, like, who knows what we'll think of even those games ten years from now. I remember seeing Metal Gear Solid 2 and Twin Snakes. And I was like, graphics will never get better than this. With the cutscenes and when you're, like, able to put guys into lockers. I was like, this is it. We've reached the peak. And today, they still look good, but, like, they they definitely show their age. There's There's also a range of, like developmental polish that even some yeah. ps4 games kind of look crummy because they're just not well yeah look that great well yeah well, e- well even on, yeah, yeah like an example for me in this in this regard is the ps3 like look at uncharted 1 mm-hmm. after you've looked at uncharted 3 like they've definitely improved up to uncharted 3 uncharted 1 looks a little more uh wa- not plasticky but like waxy a little bit um, three looks great, and obviously four is on the next gen system, so it looks even better. Mm-hmm. So, like another example would be um, Deadly Premonition, which is a Xbox 360 PS3 game. It has that really plasticky look to the models, and that's actually part of the charm. You know, the game succeeds in spite or because of it, because it makes everybody look a little bit off. Yeah, I, and that game was weird anyway. For for me, like I can't say. Uh, how I I would say like uh, t- to convert or change from like this uh, world to a different world, I I usually find myself like pretty immersed into whatever game world that I'm playing in. Like mm-hmm. let's say I'm playing like Final Fantasy, it's already I'm already pretty much immersed into the type of details it is. Because if I start thinking about how like oh it looks so shitty or something like that, it's it's just not gonna be good for my game playing experience. And like um. You know, we you know we all grew up in like the, the pixel world type of gameplay. Yeah. Uh, maybe not not quite like like back in the day asteroid with the Atari and everything. Uh, no, nah, that's a little that's a little far for that's us. That's a little far for us, but um, but we were like Nintendo Super Nintendo people. Yes. Yeah, so we we grew up in a time where like platforming or platformers were like like yep the the thing, and we were really pretty. I feel like I. When I played those games, I, I pretty much immersed. I was already immersed into that universe, um, and with like technology growing constantly every year, and software being developed every year to help develop things more closer to the three D world, or even like you know beyond that, because you know magic and. Well, yeah, but like I mean, I, I think with this question though, it's not so much like what if you could look around in a full three D world. I, I I kind of I think I did go in a misleading direction with Castlevania sixty four, but I I think what what Fakafan's really asking is more like uh, the Secret of Mana uh, on the Super Nintendo versus the Secret of Mana on PS four, which has it's the same game but it has three D style graphics, even though you're still moving the same way you would have in the original game. So like converting to and from sprites in that regard like what if you what if you had chrono trigger again but the characters were more round and that was the only change you know something like that so one thing to keep in mind here i like i've watched the secret of mana remake for the ps4 a lot i haven't played it yet but it doesn't look that bad i have to say um Mm -hmm. i had been talking to some people about this recently and i'm sure we've talked about this before in the podcast and i'm sure like vice knows a lot about this too and he'd have something to say if he was on this week or maybe he'll respond in the comments um and he should give us five star ratings in itunes (laughs) (laughs) be sure to subscribe um but old nes and snes and genesis games and like turbo graphics games were played on crts mostly and there was a like an automatic anti-aliasing that happened on those old tvs because of the way that the 
CRG displays worked that made them look a little fuzzier or not as sharp and made them look like more 3D. So if you look at like how like a, a lot of emulators, if you try to play like Game Boy or SNES, they try to capture this as a filter, but it still doesn't yeah. look as good as like how the CRT fools your eyes into making you think that the image is more 3D than it really uh, is. You're talking about like the the current uh the you know the not recent but like the new release of the the emulator game the well, the, the, I mean, there's the NES Classic and the SNES Classic, but even before that, like, I had a Game Boy emulator. I think Virtual Boy Advance was one of them. Um, it actually had a a filter that s- smoothed out the blocky edges of the sprites. Looked nicer than playing on a regular Game Boy, but not as nice as playing on a CRT. Um, yeah, actually, and, and I, I can confirm that visual as well, because, like, you, you might have heard Vice talk about this before, but you know the upscaler device, the Frame Meister, or the yeah. OSSC? So, um, this is something that... It's funny you mention this, because CRTs did have that fuzzy effect, but at the same time, it may have also been a limitation of the type of uh, cables we used, because, you know, I, I grew up playing Sonic the Hedgehog, and it had that sort of fuzzy look, and I was just like, that's how it looks. But once I, I hooked up an RGB... Uh, SCART cable, which is supposed to like typically be Europe only, mm-hmm. but they just had better quality CRTs than we did. Uh, once I fed like an RGB signal into my Genesis, the the pixels were more pronounced. It it actually provides you with a sharper image, which looks pretty cool. Yeah, I'm sure there's like different interpretations of the CRT for different televisions. Like I'm sure it looks yeah. different depending upon what kind of TV you have. Like, yeah, and which is better is just CRTs. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, there are those. Uh, and of course, which is better is just up to interpretation. But like the RGB would provide the the sharper image, whereas composite and S video would provide like the best sort of like blur the pixels together to look like it's like a like a drawing, like a smooth kind of image uh, in that sense. Right. So it's not really clear to me. All I'm trying to say is that like slightly dated sprites are not necessarily better than like below top generation 3d models when you're comparing them side by side yeah Um, like like this is a thing that's really easy to forget but like people weren't using sprites in the super nintendo era because it was cool like that was mm -hmm. the the new techno i mean technology but you know what i mean that that was like what the, the, the best they had to work with at the time and then they went to 3D, and now there's like a big retro movement, so we're doing all sorts of sprite stuff again. So now it's a matter of choosing your favorite visual medium. But like, they went to 3D because it was the cool thing to do, and they were using sprites because that was the, the cool thing to do, better than like the vector graphics of uh, like the like um, like like asteroids and things of that sort. Mm-hmm. So like one obvious game that really needed to be sprites is Cuphead from recent memory. Like that's the whole conceit that it's hand-drawn animation, it would never work as a 3D game. Well, that was the thing. Like, is, is Cuphead even sprites, though? Like, that literally is hand-drawn cartoon animation. Well, I mean, what's a sprite? It's just, like, a handmade, you know... I mean, that, that's fair art. enough. I, 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 well, yeah, that's that's the thing. Yeah, sprites is pixel art, or at least that's what I picture it as. But... Yeah, like, this This is literally, like, Warner Brothers cartoon. Yeah, like, I wouldn't just call encoded, Bugs Bunny a spray. You know, a, an, a, an, an SNES has, what, like, 220 by, by 240 resolution, or 192 by 240 or something? Something so weird, like, yeah. that's the resolution of a sprite, is, like, that size scales oh, to okay. of a... So, you know, Cuphead is just a sprite, but scaled to, you know, 1080p. Okay, okay. I guess I, 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 I don't know gorgeous. if it's, I don't know if it uses the maximum resolution of your of your like laptop screen or whatever. I think when people talk yeah, I don't about know. sprite, they're thinking about like the pixelated type. Mm-hmm. Of yeah, that, that's how that's how I envision it. Because uh, again, like I, I don't know if I would call Bugs Bunny a sprite, even if it does technically fit the definition. Yeah. I'm not sure. I'm not sure it fits the definition, like uh, Cuphead style. It's just not something that's very common because, like, damn, those the the, the animators that. Oh, they worked for an insane period of time. Yeah, yeah. I mean, they, they literally had to animate, like, hours worth of cartoons. Like, yeah. that's, that's brutal. Like, to make a sprite which keeps up with, like, the current UHD generation basically requires hand-drawn animation at this point. Otherwise, yeah. it'll look pixelated, which is fine yeah. a lot of the time. It's certainly an interesting style, you know? Mm-hmm. But when, when, when to say that about, like, like fighting games, then? 
you say? Well, like like Dragon well, Ball Fighter Z have... and like Arc System yeah. Works games, those really blur the line. They could yeah. they yeah. look like hand drawn animation, but they're three D models. Ah, yeah, I was, I was gonna mention, yeah, Guilty Gear Zard, like, it's a 2D, like, the game plays on a 2D plane, but everything is 3D, so when they do the cool special moves and the camera pans around them, you get to see the actual 3D models that's going on, like, mm-hmm. that's, that's, like, the closest 2 is gonna come to 3D, and probably vice versa. <laughs> it's, a, it's a huge achievement, you know, it uses that shading technology to, like, make something look a little bit like a cartoon, much better than the cell shading on, like, The Wind Waker or something. Um, yeah, the Wind Waker has a, d- a distinctive look for sure, right. but like, yeah, more like watching an actual Dragon Ball Z cartoon, like Dragon Ball Fighter Z, does bridge that gap. Wind Waker and Killer Seven look more like, uh, geez, this is hard. Um, like like certain kinds of comic books, I guess. Um, that that kind of look, the cel shaded look, um, like, like like a Scanner Darkly or something like that. Oh, yeah. If that makes any sense to anybody. <laughs> So Dragon Ball Fighter Z, if that's cell shaded, then is Dragon Ball Fighter Z perfect cell shaded? Oh, uh, that's stupid. Nice. <laughs> no, it's not. It's the best. <laughs> yeah, I'm on. I'm on board with that. Another one I'd like to toss out there is Shovel Knight. Like the whole point yeah. of conceit of that game is that it's sort of like retro styled to an NES game. And like and I actually remember NES. complaining at the time when it came out that I wish, like. I felt like they put too many restrictions on themselves to make it look like an NES game. And, like, maybe if they had more time, they could have made it, like, a beyond SNES, like, awesome sprite-based game. And instead they, like, really chose to fixate on making it like an NES game. Not that the game isn't amazing, but... Yeah, like, everybody loves the game who's playing it. For nostalgia purposes, you know, they can make an SNES-style Shovel Knight. But then after that, like, if they made an N64-style Shovel Knight, it probably looked like garbage. You know? Yeah. Well, actually, although that said, though, the original Shovel Knight, like, as far as, like, the drawing of characters, yeah, that's old school NES, but I think it does have more colors displayed on screen at one time than an original NES could handle, mm-hmm. and I think there was one particular night, I think I mentioned this before, like, like the Snow Knight, whatever he's called, Blizzard Knight or something, the guy with the snow shovel, um, he's got this, like, khaki, like, tan color that I think was never on the NES. I, he's I like the, the, he's the odd color out. I think the number of colors they tried to keep accurate to NES, but I wouldn't be surprised if like the shading themselves was not permissible. Oh, maybe that's what it was. Nintendo. Because if you read their developer blog, I think the game is interesting because it like teaches you the kinds of tricks that developers had to use to yeah. um, get a better game to fit within the NES restrictions. Like one of them was that. They learned that to make the like the enemy got hit animation where they cycle through the colors, that mm-hmm. is just the regular enemy palette just like cycled through the different parts of the enemy, and it makes it look like the palette is more robust than it really is. Oh, that's clever. Yeah, I, I love little things like that. Like a classic piece of trivia for this to save space was like the clouds and the bushes in the original Super Mario Brothers are the same sprite, just one's white, one's green. Mm-hmm. Um, one one that I think is um. Oh, this, this is another one that applied to the N64, is the Boo laugh and the Bowser laugh are the same, just right. sped up and slowed down. But I think my favorite example of this, which I think is a little less well-known, is, um, y- you know in the original Super Mario Brothers, when you beat a level into the castle, it does that do 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 like that little jingle? Apparently, the that tune sped up like a bajillion times is when you get a mushroom and you grow, like that... It's like that tune like super fast... Which nice. is kind of cool. Um, and re- regarding NES games that are probably better than the NES could handle, have, have you guys taken a look? Because I only did for the first time a couple days ago. Have you seen um, Bloodstained Curse of the Moon? Uh, yes. I actually played the game. Yeah, because that's like... That's, I think, better than an NES could handle. But that's like as close to old school... Ca- like, it, it, it is a modern old school Castlevania game. It's like a little too smooth to be on the NES and I think there's more stuff going on, on the screen and there's like I mean NES had parallax scrolling in a couple of games I think, but this is like more advanced looking parallax scrolling, but it's still it's really cool that it's obviously a heavy callback to the NES. Uh yeah, so there's actually a big distinction I think between Castle between a uh, uh, Bloodstains and a lot of like retro style game these days in that a lot of games that evoke the NES or the the Mega Drive, like, they control way better than old games did. Because, like, old games use the arcade-style sensibilities where, like, you're supposed to be able to predict every enemy that you're going to face. And when you jump, you can't 
you can't like change your jump direction midway because if yeah, you jump you, into you, an you enemy, commit. it's your own damn fault. Remember, remember yeah. it's there next time and react accordingly. Or, yeah, you know, start to learn the way the machine. game is going to present obstacles to you. Mm-hmm. Um, and in Shovel Knight, you know, you can sh- it's, it's NES styled, but you control, like, flawlessly. You have perfect control of your character at all times. It's part of why the game is, you know, a 9.9 out of 10 most of the time. Yeah, um, and the game's way more forgiving about death, speaking of which. Yeah, but um, Bloodstain isn't. Like, it's, it's easier because just your life bar mechanics are pretty easy. Um, but for the most part, it actually plays like a real Castlevania game. You know, you can't, you like, you get knocked off all the time by enemies. There's like wind you levels. Can, you can't and... jump on stairs. Yeah. Although one thing I did notice, by the way, you, you climb stairs way the hell faster than in old school Castlevania. That was like the thing that I noticed the most. Like you're, you're really booking it up and down stairs. And I was very happy about that. Right. I was never able to beat the original Castlevania. I thought Bloodstained Curse of the Moon was like pretty easy though. Um, um, least... I only saw a little bit of it, but it was, I mean, yeah, like, I'm not good at Castlevania. I died a bunch of times on Curse of the Moon, but I was able to beat the second boss, so, like, oh, no, I, 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 can, I, died I can make it happen. But, you know, you don't even lose a life until, like, all your guys die, right? So... Yeah, that, that was a surprise, too, yeah, because you could swap between characters at any time, like mm-hmm. in Castlevania 3, but if you die... You just lose the one character. Yeah, and when you lose your other character, or you actually get more. So when you lose everybody, then it actually ticks down, which is pretty clever. Right. Also, and, yeah. you can quit the you can quit the game and it'll say like, Oh, you'll lose progress for this level, but and obviously in original Castlevania's you have to play the whole game at once. Right. And um well, I mean there was a password in Castlevania. Uh was at, least, there? at least some of them. I don't know about all of them. Um, Castlevania 1 through 3, really? They had I that? think there was a password in 3. Vice will correct oh, me. Oh, okay. Oh, no, fair enough. I, I okay. could be wrong. I, didn't, I haven't played 3. I didn't know that. Yeah, I'm just used to, like, this is this is very unfair, but I'm used to watching speedrunners, so they'll beat the game in, like, 20 minutes. Right. <laughs> so it's like, password, what's that? <laughs> and they'll never, they'll never die unless they really make a mistake, so it doesn't matter. Yeah, that's the thing. It's like, oh, I flubbed something, so there's my death for the run, or maybe two deaths. But yeah, like, I, I like, and this this latest GDQ, the guy beat Castlevania 1 in, like, around, like, 15 minutes, maybe a little less. Mm-hmm. And it's just like, god damn. Like, like even with save most states, people probably one spent... level would take me 15 minutes. Yeah, like, most people probably spent, like, 40 minutes on the last level alone because I kept dying the Dracula. Mm-hmm. Well, that Celeste speedrun, I will say, like, after playing the game recently myself, looks like a completely different game than what I play. Did you see the task? Yes, that was ridiculous. It was that was really terrifying. Fun. Yeah, the, the it tools surprised the speed even run. the speedrunners. <laughs> yeah, oh, yeah. Well, because it's doing stuff that's literally impossible with mm-hmm. human hands. But so, it's of amazing, course, they never tried It's it. amazing that the game even allows it to happen. Yeah, actually, that reminds me of one thing I saw. I think it was on Blaster Master from a couple of years ago. It was just a really entertaining way of describing a particular technique. It was something about doing something like dying at a certain frame or accomplishing something at a certain frame and hitting, like, like if you mess it up, you soft lock the game, but if you get it right, you skip a whole bunch of stuff. Right. And people said that they didn't discover a new trick but it was a new method for doing the trick. Mm-hmm. So, th- like, the announcer had said, it's been upgraded from tasks only to extremely difficult. <laughs> and it just, like, really amused me. There's, um, there's a, something like that on Kirby's Adventure. There's a specific thing that you can do on the first world that causes a credits warp, but it's frame perfect and requires like, oh, yeah. an incredibly bizarre series of inputs. So, in principle, a human runner who wanted the record on the game could just keep doing it over and over again but you'd never be able to do it on a marathon yeah you either yeah you either succeed in the run or you don't Mm -hmm. speaking of which did you see the super mario world uh run i did not i although i've seen many super mario world runs and i know that like the game uses arbitrary code execution and that like previous task bots have like programmed games in super mario world (laughs) Well, no, there was this one technique this guy did that I don't even know has been done in a marathon. So it's like a legendary trick for a marathon, even though the guy died a bunch of times to make it happen. There's a thing he had to do where he, like, took a shell with him to the edge of a cliff, killed another Koopa, and had its shell. And do you know about shell jumping in Super Mario World, where if you jump with a shell and you, like, drop it, you can, like... I don't know if it's frame perfect, but at least it's extremely hard. You could jump off of the shell you dropped in the air, giving you another platform, like you're bouncing off an enemy. So this guy took one of the shells jumped off a cliff and threw it vertically in the air and landed back on the cliff so the shells in the air and it's coming back down grab the other shell 
jumped off the cliff, landed on the first shell, bouncing off of it, and then shell jumped from the second shell, giving him insane horizontal distance. That shit is bananas. Oh, like, it, I, was just, it was it, it was like, amazing to see. <laughs> some Kaizo hacks of Mario will require you to do that, to do like yeah. one or more shell jumps. And it's I, I think I think my favorite Kaizo Mario trick was jumping on a Koopa and taking the shell all the way to a bed of spikes that's too long for you to jump over, mm -hmm. and like putting the shell down, waiting for the Koopa to wake up again and patrol, and then you jump off the Koopa because like you could always do that in Mario worlds, but there's you never would. Why would you? Right. So it was just really cool to see that There's it's a, actually required. Something from the, I think it's the Super Mario 3D Land run yeah. from SDGQ this year. And it ties oh, back into the original like, topic of of um, limitations of old school consoles. One yeah. of the auto-scrolling levels, you know, like in, in an older auto-scrolling level, you'd never really be able to like navigate the rest of the world like usually only the part that's being displayed would actually be loaded into memory so if yeah, you tried you to, like, go up to the edge of the that, screen yeah. either you wouldn't be able to do it or if you somehow like boundary broke the screen you just go out of bounds and die but yeah. um there's a level one of the airship levels in super mario 3d lands where it's an auto scroll but you can do the whole thing blind just oh like, wow blind. and because that's the whole insane level is in memory. so like he did it on camera that's crazy Mm -hmm. It was super impressive. Mario was a game like that the... made the jump to 3D really well, but it helps. Yeah, the it did. The best designers, even the first time Mario 64, like that. That's how you like the camera controls are kind of janky by today's standards. But as far as basic movement, like that game holds up, even yep. the N64 version. Zelda 2, and uh, well, not Pokemon because they didn't haven't really done Pokemon in 3D. Yeah, one day. <laughs> Maybe Everyone's been push. waiting for it since, like, the Super Nintendo. Mm -hmm. You know, in regards... Now that I'm, th I'm thinking about it randomly, but in regards to the world that I would live in, I would say I would like to live in Final Fantasy if... if I was the main character with insane amount yeah. of power. Yeah. But I, I was gonna say, as long as you don't, don't have, like, Kefka. All of these worlds are actually very, uh... Habitable? Habitable. I mean, yeah, no, the world is often. always doomed. You never want to live in a fictional world. But I would like to live in a world with magic and stuff. It would be nice, as long as you don't have any yeah. responsibilities recording, according to that. Well, yeah, maybe, maybe you would like Final Fantasy Crystal Chronicles' world or something. That one's pretty bad. <laughs> oh, is it? Crystal Chronicles? Yeah. I mean, the, the conceit of Crystal Chronicles is that there's, like, miasma covering the entire planet, and you can only live inside your town, but your caravan has to go out and get, uh, like, journey out into the world with a portable, like, force field. And go find wow, more, I did not know that. <laughs> more, like, mirror tree sap to replenish your force field for your town for another year. That's in okay, okay, did not know that. That's like Never the mind. worst Final Fantasy world. It <laughs> might be worse than 10. <laughs> I only played, like, the very beginning where it's like, make up your own character, check your mail in your mailbox. I'm like, oh, okay. Jesus, <laughs> I, I didn't really realize it was that crazy. The game. <laughs> no, I didn't. I played at a friend's house didn't once, so I never really the got first the first town. <laughs> Yeah, no, I didn't. So I didn't. I didn't even know about this. It's crazy. Well, let's leave this in the podcast so we can all yeah. you in the future. Oh. Yeah. Oh no, I'll definitely. Leave it. Yeah, it's, it's like <laughs> the Demon Souls of Final Fantasy. Like, go out into the fog and hope you fix whatever the problem is. Like, don't die. There we go. It looks really nice have... and happy though. Actually, all the yeah. Crystal Chronicles games they have like really tragic storylines, like sadder wow. than you'd expect based on like the look of the characters and the look of the world. They're like really wow. sad. Okay. The regular that was way Final often, Fantasy I guess. Games, they almost always have really optimistic endings, except for like maybe thirteen two. So yeah, the comfort. Even... Even Final Fantasy. Oh, for for <laughs> I just die. for fourteen, it's particularly funny because like you, the player character, is the warrior of light, you know, and people sing of your exploits and they recognize yeah. you. But, like, every other person in the world is also the Warrior of Light in their own story. And yeah, that like, is really funny. It's weird that, like, the whole world is populated with protagonists, basically. And you go in teams yeah. of 8 and 24 to go, like, do instance raids. Well, so, again, it's like Demons and Dark Souls, where, like, heroes of other worlds are just, like either helping you with your worlds or actively trying to kill you and ruin your progress, depending on what their motivations are. And it's like, well, this is weird. Yeah, but that makes sense, at least. That has a conceit. But in this, it's yeah. just... It's just like they say... 
you know, fight this boss, go gather a team of adventurers to go with you, but the team is like seven other protagonists who are Yeah, they're they're right all the gods of their own universe. And <laughs> it's like, like wow, what a what a dream team. And like do the person who gives the quest, they say goodbye to you and they but it's just like welcome someone else and like, hey, you just left. Welcome back, Warrior of Light. Go off and get <laughs> the boss. Nice. Or take a number. You, yes, yeah, right. Literally, take a number. Wait, time. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> so when you queue for an instance, they give you, like, a, a number that says, like, for your role, this is how many people are ahead of you. If you're a tank, it's, like, instant. If you're a healer, it's, like, le- slightly less than instant. If you're a DPS, it's, like, 50 people. <laughs> Everybody wants to be a fucking DPS. All right, so anyway, we, we did bounce in and out of the subject for a little while, but does anybody have any final thoughts on 2D to 3D or vice versa? I The one thing I want to say is that even though you mentioned it and I had a positive view on it, I'm so sad that the conversion to 3D basically lost us the Mana series. And it's not entirely the series' fault, it's mostly like Kingdom Hearts' fault, because like they stopped making Mana games and or like tried to make them in different genres, so they didn't look like the Kingdom Hearts games, kind of. Yeah, yeah. But, like, oh, oh, you mean, like, Legend of Mana and stuff like that? Yeah, so, like, Legend of Mana was a sprite-based game. And then after that, like, every... So, like, there was Heroes of Mana, which is a tactical game. There was Children mm-hmm. of Mana, which is, like, a, a, a hack and slash. Um, there was Dawn of Mana, which is a horrible, like, physics-based brawler. They, like, really <laughs> tried to play with the... Are you saying that because I'm a... You should, look, Mitz is laughing. Is it because I'm a physicist and I said physics-based brawler and horrible? <laughs> what physics-based is horrible? If you... Have have you seen yourself... I quit physics. My, <laughs> Don't at me. <laughs> have you seen yourself defending against my my boxing punches? Uh... <laughs> I, I have not done such a thing. So we do this <laughs> at the gym. Like, um... Uh, we ha- we have a personal trainer at the gym, and he has Mitz do um, boxing for cardio, and he's taught mm-hmm. me how to take them with mitts, um, like boxing mitts. Um, and so he's like, he's like, so, I mean, he's my real name, but he's like, so, old man Stompy, you know, your wife has quite I the punch. I love to imagine you called the old man Stompy. <laughs> <laughs> so, your wife has quite the punch, you know, I was like, you don't have to tell me that, and he felt really bad. <laughs> <laughs> but then later... Yeah. You know, we came back the next day, and she showed the trainer a video of, like, this guy who was, like, chopping wood, like, with one axe in each hand. Because someone sent it <laughs> to her. Someone sent it to her. He was like, hey, look, it's a warrior from Final Fantasy fourteen in real life. So yeah. she came all excited and pumped, and she showed the trainer. And he was like, you know what? That's a great exercise. I'm going to teach you how to chop an axe. I was like, god damn it. You made our <laughs> workout so much harder today because you <laughs> showed this guy this stupid video. Shouldn't have asked him the question. <laughs> Shut the fuck up. <laughs> I swear to God. All right, so, yeah, a- any final thoughts, though, on no. 2D, 3D, uh, outside of the, the mana stuff? Yeah. No, I'm done. <laughs> well, all right, if that's the case, then that's the show for this week. We want to thank all of our fans who contributed questions. Please keep us supplied with awesome topics by submitting questions of your own on the YouTube and SoundCloud pages. And while there, please give us thumbs ups, likes, and five star ratings on iTunes. It helps us promote and spread awareness of the show, and any bit of encouragement keeps the show going. You can also catch us on Tuesdays on our sister podcast, Reactive Consciousness, the in depth look at this week in our lives. Finally, you can follow me on my YouTube channel, Lotus Prince. You can hit me up on Twitter at, at Lotus Prince. And if you are interested in seeing my videos early, getting in on exclusive live streams, selecting upcoming games for me to let's play, getting in on discords with every other patron, then perhaps consider swinging by my Patreon account, which can be found at patreon.com slash lotusprince. Uh, and you can find me as Old Man Stompy on basically every major social media or gaming network except for Steam. Uh, and I would like to extend a casual invitation to Vice to come back and also do the food topic, because I know it's his and his girlfriend's thing, so we'd be happy to discuss it with them. Hmm. hmm. As Minty Mitz, uh, you can see me frolicking around in the Final Fantasy world somewhere. She's a cook in real life and a culinarian in 14. I'm a level 70 culinarian. Nice. <laughs> in Final Fantasy. That's the highest Making level. Making all those food that are really, really good and tasty, and I have experienced them in the actual Eorzea Cafe in Japan. Oh, that's they awesome. The same. They look the same, actually. It's actually really great. I was like, they, I know what this food is because I made it in the game. They look way better in real life. 
Did you ask the cafe why they ripped off a of Final Fantasy XIV? Oh, 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 no. They just Wait a minute, this is video game food. <laughs> anyway, thank you for listening. Until next time, everyone. Bye, everybody. Cheers.